Hi, I'm Miss Pliskin, and today I'm building a Queen Anne-style Victorian mansion, inspired by a floor plan from a plan book called Modern Dwellings, published in 1901. <laughs> Modern is relative after all, I guess. <laughs> this floor plan includes a price estimate of $12,000, or about $420,000 today, but there's no way that you could build this amazing mansion for that price today. It's got a billiard room for crying out loud. The $12,000 price tag also includes, and I quote, the finest plumbing, hardwood finish, and water heat. Not bad for 1901. And since it includes a water heater, the house will have radiators rather than fireplaces for heat. But of course, there's still two fireplaces included, mostly for decorative purposes. I chose this plan because I had a recommendation to build a Victorian mansion, and when I think Victorian mansion, what comes to mind is a big asymmetric facade with intricate woodwork of spindles, dental trim, and shingled walls, and of course, a big old round tower. I've really avoided building Queen Anne style homes because we didn't have round walls before, but now we do. Uh, this is actually the first time I've attempted a build with the new round walls, so go big or go home, right? Who needs practice? Though, on that note, if you find the round walls frustrating and buggy, because they are frustrating and buggy, there are many, many Queen Anne-style mansions that have square or octagonal towers, so that's an option too. I'm just really, really excited about round walls, so we're going for a round tower. Queen Anne-style homes were a popular build style in the late 1800s to the very early 1900s, and you'll know them when you see them because they've typically got a very prominent front-facing gable with a steeply pitched roof. Sometimes they'll have a tower, but frequently won't. Nearly always asymmetrical, with a distinct aversion to simplicity. Plain, unornamented siding is to be avoided at all costs, which means if you've got a flat exterior surface, slap on a bay window, a big old porch, or some gingerbread. Other details that were super popular include pattern shingles and brickwork, decorated chimneys, spindle work, finials, stained glass windows, gabled roofs that project over a bay window with corner brackets, basically anything to avoid a plain wall. There are also a couple of different subgenres to the Queen Anne style in case you need to pick one out of a police lineup. There's the kind that have very delicate spindle work on the porches, friezes, and gable ornaments. You'll see lacy brackets and beaded friezes or spandrels. These are the kind of houses I usually see painted quirky colors. And this is basically the kind of house that I'm building now. Other Queen Anne houses have significantly less of the spindly stuff and typically have classical columns, dental molding, and Palladian windows. And these are called free classic style. Overall, this effect is more refined, less cluttered, but a lot less fun in my opinion. Another type of Queen Anne is the one that's heavy on the patterned masonry. So these are usually brick or stone houses with decorative brick or terracotta tiles and relatively little wood details. And finally, there's also some variations that have heavier woodwork with prominent half timber details that look very Tudor. But these last two types are much more rare, at least in America anyway. But don't be afraid to mix and match. I've put some half timber trim details in the gables of this house, and I think it complements it very well. You can see it took me forever to settle on a color scheme for this house. I finally decided to go with this nice cream color for the siding with green and red trim. And I think if this was literally any other house style besides Queen Anne, a red and green house would be an abomination, but I think it looks pretty cute here. Almost has a Christmassy sort of vibe. The stereotypical Western Christmas is very Victorian inspired, so this totally fits. I'm also personally desperate for some cooler temperatures, so if I can manifest some of that, that would be great. After I settled on the colors, mostly driven by what kind of trim pieces I had to work with in coordinating colors, I pretty much went crazy with the trim, brackets, cornices, molding, anything I could find really. So I mentioned how these houses avoided plain flat walls and will often have towers and bay windows, recessed porches, cantilevered second story bay windows, or other upper story overhangs. And the thing that made all of this floor plan weirdness possible was a new innovation in house framing called balloon framing. And to explain, 
the most common way to build houses since basically medieval times all the way through today is to have some sort of vertical structural beams placed some distance apart with whatever wall material layered over that basic structural frame. Well, medieval homes use the post and girt system where very heavy hand-hewn posts were placed at the corners of a building with some very widely spaced posts in between. The majority of the second story load fell on these corner posts and as a result of requiring these heavy, expensive corner posts, most houses built before 1830 are basically just boxes in order to reduce the number of corners required to brace. However, in the 1830s, with the advent of industrial sawmills and therefore the availability of commercially cut lumber, balloon framing was made possible. This looks very, very similar to modern day construction in that the frame has many more smaller structural supports along the exterior wall, but also some structural supports in the interior walls. This allowed for much cheaper construction of irregular floor plans, which is why you see so many cool looking Victorian homes. They really went crazy with the floor plans once balloon framing came on the scene. The name Queen Anne style is kind of interesting. Usually when you've got a house style named after a regent, it's because the style was popular during their reign. Not the case here. Nothing about Queen Anne style houses was a revival from the styles popular during her reign. What was popular during Queen Anne's reign was English Baroque, which basically looks like your typical Georgian style mansion. The Victorian era Queen Anne style takes more inspiration from medieval English styles and weirdly even some 17th century Dutch influences, but a lot of the characteristics we typically associate with the Queen Anne style, like the elaborate spindly woodwork, was kind of just an American interpretation of the Queen Anne style. The first Queen Anne style house designed by an English architect by the name of Richard Norman Shaw in Sussex called Leeswood House looks very much Tudor inspired. Unfortunately, Leeswood was heavily altered in the 50s, so it doesn't really look that cool anymore, but it's still pretty iconic and I would love to see it in person if I ever got the chance. And if you keep in mind this Tudor inspired lineage when looking at a lot of these Queen Anne homes, it'll start to really pop out at you like the half timber details or the smaller windows all lined up in a row, all snug next to each other. It's such an eclectic style though, especially once the Americans got a hold of it. They really went a bit crazy at times. And it's funny because today I think the style is widely admired, but in its heyday, the style definitely received some harsh criticism for straying too much from classical ideals and getting a little too wild sometimes. How someone can look at a house like this and criticize, I'll never know, but who really knows with those crazy Victorians. Since I'm building a Victorian mansion, I have got to talk about the weirdos that are the Victorians for a bit. A couple of interesting dining room related developments started happening during the Victorian era. For one thing, dinner started getting complicated. First of all, dinner started being served in courses. Before this, dinners with multiple dishes were all set out on the table at once. Serving dinner in courses could really push out a dinner to quite late in the evening. There are some written records of people complaining about this new way of having dinner, complaining about how you've got to wait for everyone to finish a course before getting the next one and how dinners would just drag. And there was a lot of new etiquette packed into this new Victorian dinner. Tons and tons of new utensils were introduced to the place settings. Extremely bafflingly specific utensils like cheese scoops, toast forks, butter picks, whatever the heck a food pusher is, grape shears, cucumber server, olive spoons, cake breakers, oyster prongs, the list goes on and on. If there was a food or a dish served at dinner, there was a specialty utensil to serve and eat it. Not only did the place settings get wildly complicated, but so did the actual etiquette. The Victorians were really, really big on etiquette and proper protocol. Like, if you wanted to take a drink of wine, you needed to get someone else to take a drink with you. You were not allowed to talk about the food or even really examine the food. Smelling the food was considered extremely rude. Husbands and wives weren't allowed to sit next to each other, uh, maybe to prevent them from carrying on like private conversations because we're mingling people. No elbows on the table. Uh, that one might be commonly known. 
but the Victorians also expected you to never put your hands on the table at all, and absolutely no fiddling with the silverware. And no dipping bread into gravy, the most offensive rule yet. Okay, so dinners were a complicated affair with apparently a lot of wasted gravy, but another interesting dinner development is that dinner time used to be really variable before Victorian times, uh, but it used to be much closer to the middle of the day. Two random things pushed dinner to a more uniform spot in the early evening. The ever-expanding burden of etiquette required people to pay a visit to anyone who had dropped by the day before, but that they didn't see. Which is funny because the people they were visiting were probably doing the same, creating a never-ending loop of missed visitors, taking up a large portion of the afternoon, just trying to track down all these people. <laughs> and the other thing that pushed dinner late was theater times getting later and later. You'd always have dinner before going to the theater, and now theater shows could be indoors at night thanks to the advent of artificial lighting. Theaters were lit by limelight, which meant your dinner was also pushed later. And yes, the origin of the metaphor for being famous as being in the limelight started with that type of intense white lighting that theaters use called limelight. So anyway, now you've got this massive gap between breakfast and dinner, and that necessitated the invention of a smaller midday meal to tide you over until later called luncheon. Originally, luncheon was a sort of unit of measurement, basically the amount of food you could fit in your hand, but eventually it came to be known as the midday meal. Dinner adjacent is, of course, the kitchen situation. A lot of these Victorian-era floor plans have multiple separate rooms that comprise the kitchen. It wouldn't be at all unusual to have a separate room for the scullery, the room to wash dishes, the larder, the room to store meat, the pantry, the room to store grains and preserves, and of course, the kitchen itself, the room to do the cooking. This particular floor plan has a combined scullery and kitchen and a separate room with a combined larder and pantry which means one room has a sink and a stove, and another room has an ice box and dry food storage. It's not a super efficient use of space or the easiest to work in logistically, but naturally they'd have servants to deal with that, which is another notable feature of this house. It has a back staircase for the staff that leads to a separate upstairs space for servants quarters. One thing Victorian houses are noted for is the abundance of wallpaper. Literally every wall needed to be papered for some reason. A couple of things come into play here with the popularity of wallpaper with the Victorians. One thing is just at the turn of the 19th century was when wallpaper printing machines started to come around. So printing wallpaper wasn't so laborious. Wallpaper was still extremely expensive though because it was heavily taxed in England until 1836. So after the tax was repealed, it naturally became much more affordable and much more popular. After the repeal of this tax, wallpaper was really all the rage, but unfortunately dyeing techniques at the time were extremely dangerous and wallpaper ended up just loaded with arsenic for beautiful greens, lead for crisp whites, and antimony for use as a fixative, all of which you should really not be around. <laughs> And if you happen to be in a relatively moist environment, like say England, then you really don't want to be around this wallpaper because with exposure to moisture, these chemicals would leach out of the wallpaper and taint the air. One positive side effect was that homeowners noticed that their rooms with green wallpaper never had bed bugs. Yay, but also concerning. <laughs> This is around the same time that the popular form of health tourism called change of air was going on, and it was probably a completely valid medical prescription when your bedroom is filled with arsenic. And not to mention this was also a time when city air was extremely polluted with coal smoke. Can you imagine your doctor nowadays writing you a prescription to stay out of green rooms and cities? Sounds rough. Okay, so speaking of creepy rooms, I want to talk a bit about the bedroom I'm furnishing now. It's kind of random. For the other bedrooms, I wasn't totally sure what to do except fairly formal, traditionally furnished bedrooms. But for this little nook of a bedroom, I decided to go a little bit crazy with the occult clutter. The Victorians were big fans of the occult. And I kind of want to do a whole deep dive video on Victorians and their love of all things creepy and otherworldly. 
I'm sure I could just go on and on about it. Maybe I'll do something a bit spooky for Halloween. I don't know. Anyway, this room I imagine to be the bedroom of one such occult crazed Victorian, obsessed with death and communicating with those from beyond the grave. And by complete coincidence, while I was trying to get some pretty pictures for the end of this video, the sim I had on this lot died of heat stroke. So their urn is on the mantle. <laughs> so that worked out well because hopefully that means I've accidentally made this place haunted. Well, we're coming up to the end of the build, but stick around to the very end for some glamour shots. And let me know in the comments if you have any building or architecture style requests. I have been loving the ideas you've given me so far. They have all been fantastic. Thank you so much for those. And if you're interested in art, architecture, and history, please consider subscribing. I have many more of these videos planned, and thank you so much for watching.